Hey all, my name is Prashant Kumar, or PK, and I'm an MCAT tutor at Shamassian Academic Consulting. Today, we're going to be tackling an MCAT psych soj passage. You should be taking roughly nine and a half minutes on this passage, but today we're going to be going more in depth so you can see exactly what's going on in my head as I tackle this section. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel, and comment exactly what types of videos you're looking forward to next so we can tailor them to you. Let's get it. Alright, great. So I've gone ahead and put the passage on the left and the questions we're going through on the right. So feel free to take a moment, pause the video, and come back to us when you're ready. I'll go ahead and zoom in on the passage so you can get a better read. Paragraph 1, 2, 3, figure 1, paragraph 4, figure 2. And then the questions we'll go through right here. Question 1, question 2, question 3. Question four, question five, and question six. All right, so with that, take a moment, pause the video, come back to us whenever you're ready. If not, let's get right into talking strategy. For me, I like to maintain the same strategy regardless of what passage I'm going through. Why? It gives me something to come back to regardless of whether the passage is super, super easy or super, super challenging. Having something to ground yourself on test day is very, very important in boosting confidence. So if a hard passage comes up, I know exactly how I'm going to dissect it. I'm going to use that strategy, break it down, and be confident and quick. I'm not going to waste time stressing about anything else. So what's my strategy? I like to read a paragraph, write a quick three to five word summary, then move on to the next paragraph, do the same, and on and on and on. Why do I do this? Well, that three to five word summary is not going to take too much time, but it adds a lot of value. It makes sure you understand exactly what's going on in that paragraph before moving on to the next. It's sort of an accountability check. A lot of times I'd find myself reading an entire passage, not really understanding what's going on, and having to reread and waste a lot of time rereading. So with this, I'm able to read a paragraph, check in if I understand, ask myself what's going on, and then move to the next paragraph. If I don't, I can just reread that paragraph as opposed to rereading an entire passage. Additionally, I don't spend too much time on my figures on that first read. Why? If a question asks us to come back to the figure, we're going to have to come back to the figure more likely than not. And if a question doesn't ask us to come back to the figure, why would we waste time spending, spending it on looking at a figure that's not going to be tested? So those are my tips and tricks to tackle this section. But with that, let's get right into that first paragraph. Globally, the provision of health services to rural areas remains a challenge. Providing maternal health care is of special concern as outlined by the sustainable development goal of reducing maternal mortality. All right, so the question I always ask myself at these paragraphs, after these paragraphs is, what's going on? And you can use simple English, abbreviations, symbols, whatever you need to, to get through this. But here, it's maternal health in rural seems to be what they're talking about, right? Reducing maternal, maternal mortality. And so with that, we can go right on to the next paragraph because you have a good understanding of what's going on in that paragraph. The use of traditional medicine in sub-Saharan Africa is viewed by local communities as a stopgap to the exorbitant costs associated with modern health facilities. In the Zimbabwean context, the preference to perform childbirth at home and to use traditional medicine, uh, TM, is influenced by religion, cost of health care, distance to facilities, and educational status. TM has been used since the pre-colonial era, with over 80% of the population relying on traditional remedies and indigenous knowledge passed down generations. All right, so the question again is, what's going on? So here we have the idea of TM resulting in reduced costs um, in, in Africa, right? So something simple about how we're talking about uh, traditional medicine as like an alternative to help cut costs for this. Regardless if there's details, I don't want you to spend too much time on the details. I want you to have a big picture understanding at the end of the day. And so with that, we're going on to the next paragraph. A survey of 177 pregnant women was conducted to determine the demographic qualities of the woman in addition to any TM used during their pregnancy. The results of the demographic study are shown in figure one. All right, so what's, that, what's the thing, what's happening? What's the question that we ask? What's going on? And so here, we're just saying study, right? It's a study looking at demographics of preg woman, okay? And that's how it's looking at TM. It's something quick. 
How are we um, going to look at the data? Well, it gives us a figure, right? And what did I say? I'm not going to spend too much time on the figure. Maybe give a quick glance. Um, I see demographic factors on the left. I see does not use TM, does use TM on the right. And then like you can also even just see it right here, demographic qualities of Zimbabwe and win. All right, and so with that, we don't really need to spend too much time and we can go on to the next paragraph. Approximately one quarter of the surveyed women reported using TM during pregnancy, with a more significant proportion of women using TM during the third trimester of pregnancy. The prevalence and perceived safety of TM is shown in figure two. All right, so the question again is what's happening? Here, we're gonna say one third use TM and then increase in third try. So again, not going to focus too much on the details, but this is a short paragraph, so it's a pretty summarizing statement. And we can look at that figure, quick perceived safety of TM. So we're looking at safety of TM during pregnancy. That's the study. So study two, safety. All right, awesome. And so with that, we've actually dissected this passage really, really quickly, right? We have not spent too much time on the details. We have a big picture understanding of what the passage is talking about, and we're ready to go right into our questions. So let's go right into question number one. The passing of TM from one generation to another is best described as A, cultural diffusion, B, cultural transmission, C, intergenerational mobility, or D, intragenerational mobility. All right, so for psych -soc, one of the biggest tips I have is to make sure you understand all of these terms because the MCAT has a pool of terms that they pull from, and it's going to be those same terms over and over again that come up. So here, if, even if it's not the correct answer choice, I want you to know what these terms mean. So first, we're looking at the passage of TM. So traditional medicine, if we, in case we didn't remember, from one generation to another. So right away, we're passing a cultural value, right? A traditional medicine, a cultural technique. So we can eliminate two choices right away, and that's C and D. Why? Because mobility inter and intrageneration is talking about moving up or down social classes. So intergenerational uh, mobility is like when your parents transition uh, to you and you move in a different like um, the social hierarchy of like wealthy or, um, or poor, you're moving up and down that ladder, right? So this is moving up social classes and moving down social classes um, between generations. So from mother, father to son, daughter. Uh, intragenerational is within your generation, so within your lifetime. So I'll write that, within lifetime, and then within multiple generations, okay? So that's the idea, is like, here we have two terms that are talking about moving up and down social classes, not necessarily um, trans transmission of cultural values. And so we have A and B talking about diffusion versus transmission. And so right away, we should understand these terms. So diffusion means the ability for one culture's values to affect another culture's values. So you're like permeating into other cultures. And so in this case, we're talking about a generational change, right? One generation to another. Not really this generation affecting, an, or this group affecting another group. And so we can eliminate E, A, and be left with B. Cultural transmission. And this is exactly that, right? It's the idea that we're transmitting cultural values from one generation to the next. And that's the definition of cultural transmission. Like, uh, whether your parents' culture impacts your own, are you adopting those values or not? And so with that, we're one for one, on to the next question. Oops. Question number two. Okay. A young, simple, employed woman experiencing complications with her pregnancy requests time off from her work to address the needs of her pregnancy. In doing so, she's demonstrating A, role conflict between her two roles as an employee and a pregnant mother, B, culture shock as her workplace culture is unreceptive and detrimental to her pregnancy, C, the sick role as she shifts her responsibilities towards recuperating from an illness, D, learned helplessness as there is little she can do to improve her situation. All right, again, we want to make sure that we understand the terms that are going through the, these paragraphs, or uh, these answer choices. And so here, we actually have a standalone question again, so we're not going to have to go back to the passage. But let's look at the question, right? Complications with pregnancy, request time off to address them, right? So here, we have sort of a situation where someone's getting like um, worse off in their health or something, so they have to take a little bit of time off. And so right away, we can eliminate two of the answer choices because they don't really relate, right? So B, culture shock, 
Uh, it says our workplace culture is unreceptive. There's no evidence to support that answer, so we can eliminate B almost immediately. In D, learn helplessness, as there's little she can do to improve her situation. Again, we don't have any evidence to support this, so we can eliminate D. All right, so now we're down to A, role conflict, or C, the sick role. And so role conflict is a specific thing where you can't, where it's very challenging to have two separate positions um, because they conflict with each other. And so in this case, it's saying that the role of being an employee is um, in, uh, being uh, challenged by the role of being a pregnant mother. And we already know that this is not the case, right? Um, just looking at that, it's not the fact that she is a pregnant mother um, being uh, conflicting with the fact that she's employed. It's the fact that there are complications directly affecting um, her ability to be an employee. So A doesn't really make sense. And the better answer is C, the sick role, right? In this case, these complications are analogous to her being sick. And so as we say, this is the sick role, we are shifting like these responsibilities away to recuperate, right? It's, a, it's like a specific cause and um, effect, right? Because she is sick, she is taking on this role to recover so she can come back to being an employee. And so C is our best answer, and we can move on to question number three. Great. Question number three. Suppose that in a nearby community, local institutions such as churches, schools, employers, and hospitals all work together to provide specific support to a woman in a time of pregnancy. This, is most, closely follows a, this most closely follows a model of interaction outlined by A structural functionalism, B, symbolic interactionism, C, conflict theory, D, rational choice exchange theory. All right, so again, what I say? We have to know these terms because these terms come up over and over again, right? On the test, if we know all of these terms, it's going to be a lot easier to get through uh, all of these answers. So A, structural functionalism. What is that? Functionalism is the idea that there's a lot of like institutions and they work together and they all have their own roles and functions, right? And so with that, they're able to create some sort of equilibrium of each role has its own like values and things that it's supposed to do. Um, and so that is the idea of structural functions. And it's basically all built upon institutions doing their role. B, symbolic interactionism is this idea that interactions give objects meaning or give um, sort of things, definitions and meanings, right? And so that's what it's identifying is that it's a microscopic level of person to person. Um, or person to object, and that, that's what gives everything their own meanings. Conflict theory is this macroscopic of the overview of like two um, groups conf uh, have conflict between each other, and they will conflict, conflict, conflict until they have some sort of uh, equilibrium, and then it's the idea of that conflict results in equilibrium, and so that's a macroscopic theory. Rational choice and exchange theory is that just an idea that humans operate on this rational, um, logical thought process, and so they'll make decisions based on these rational choices. So right away, we see this key sort of understanding of community and local institutions. So our alarm bell should be ringing of structural functionalism because these institutions of churches, schools, employers, hospitals are working together to sort of support this woman. And each of these are institutions that take on roles. So A is looking like a really good answer right now. Symbolic interactionism is sort of a microscopic level of person to person. So we can eliminate that because here we're dealing with institutions or larger bodies. C, conflict theory doesn't really make sense here. There's no conflict um, in this sort of macroscopic perspective, right? We're not talking about social classes. We're not talking about society being, conflict, being conflicting. And then D, rational choice exchange theory. Again, a good definition to know doesn't really relate here because we're not talking about logical choices. And so with that, we're three for three, and we're on to question number four. Based on the information presented in figure two, what can the researchers most reasonably conclude? A, practitioners of TM are part of a counterculture. B, practitioners of TM are part of a subculture. C, de-individuation has led to a negative perception of TM. Or D, globalization has led to a negative perception of TM. All right, again, we're going to have to go through these terms and understand what's going on. But basically, we're going to have to look at figure two, right? And we're looking for a conclusion, so evidence-based um, conclusion. So make sure we understand these words. Counterculture, right? It's a culture that goes against, right? Uh, opposes mainstream, okay? 
America, and then subculture is sort of a smaller group, right? Not necessarily against, it's just a smaller group than, than the majority. Okay, de-individuation, sort of this perspective that we're losing our individualness uh, when we're in a larger group. And then de-globalization is the idea that we're expanding to uh, make the world more connected. And so with that, we have to understand that figure two is talking about what? Perceived safety of TM usage during pregnancy. So we're specifically talking about TM usage. Um, and so right away, we should be understanding that C and D don't really make sense, right? Because we have, A, we have no evidence of globalization or de-individuation affecting anything, but also it doesn't really give us a clear perspective on whether or not there's a negative perception, right? If we look at don't know, it's a majority of this is 66.7. Um, not safe, 22, safe, 11.3. But again, there's no clear evidence supporting that there's a negative perception of TM. So we're down to A and B. And so here, are we talking about it being a counterculture or a subculture? And so that's the question we're going to ask. And so a counterculture has to oppose the mainstream completely. And in this case, we don't really have any evidence of that, right? And we are looking for a, sp a strict conclusion of that. And so it says one quarter of the surveyed women uh, reported using TM during pregnancy with a more significant proportion of women using TM. And there's nowhere does it say that we're going against the majority culture. We're just using it as a part of the culture, which indicates that A is incorrect and B is our subculture answer. And so with that, we are four for four and we're on to question number five. All right, question number five. The acceptance and promotion of traditional medicine as an alternative or supplement to modern medicine may be linked to the comparatively large vocabulary in the local language that describes it. This is most directly supported by A, a nativist theory of language acquisition, B, behaviorist theory of language acquisition, C, linguistic relativism, D, James Lange theory. All right, so right away, we're looking at a standalone question that's talking about how does large vocabulary um, link to the alternative or supplement of modern medicine with traditional medicine, right? And so it's saying that this vocabulary is innately linking us to have these perspectives of acceptance and promotion of traditional medicine. And so what theory does that sort of um, link with best? And that is one of these lingual theories, not James Lange theory. James Lange, as it relates to emotional responses to certain situations. So we're not even gonna think about that right now. Instead, we're gonna go to A, B, or C, nativist theory, behaviorist theory, or linguistic. And so nativist theory has this assumption that from this birth age, right, from when we're born, we have some sort of natural ability to acquire language. And so we're innately predisposed to sort of understand exactly what's going on with the language and we'll acquire it over time. So that's like an innate understanding. A B, a behaviorist theory, is um, how we acquire language through like this associative learning. As we sort of interact and have positive experiences, negative experiences, uh, we keep interact, we keep uh, building on our language. And so that's uh, as we sort of do things, we associate them with other things, and that's how we build language. And then C, linguistic relativism, is this idea that our perception is shaped by our language, right? So our language is really affecting how we sort of interact with things or we um, connect with things. And so that is looking like our best answer. Why? Because here it's saying the large vocabulary in the local language that describes it is linked to this acceptance and a promotion. Uh, and so it doesn't really talk about from a birth age how we're like naturally acquiring language, nor does it associate, nor is it an associative based learning. And so C is our best answer. Finally, we're going to go on to question number six. I think I'll have to go back here. The researchers would like to perform a follow-up experiment to determine the impact of a certain traditional interventions on the long-term health of children born from these pregnancies. Which of the following study designs would be most appropriate? A, a randomized controlled study, a B, double-blinded experimental study, C, longitudinal study, or D, case study. All right, so what is the investigation that they want to look at? Look, what is it looking at? Determining the impact of certain traditional inventions on the long-term health, okay, of children born from these pregnancies, right? So it's looking at long-term health. And so when we're looking at long-term health, it's like a more of an observational study, right? We're not really focusing on... Um, how it changes. There's no question about whether one treatment's better than the other. It's looking at sort of long-term, just observational data. 
And so right away, we can eliminate A and B, right? Because randomized controlled and double-blind experimental studies are both testing a theory out as well as comparing it to a status quo um, or another type of treatment. And so we can eliminate A and B almost immediately. A longitudinal study is looking like our best bet. Why? Because it's an observational study that looks over periods of time, especially longer periods of time. And that's exactly what the question's asking, right? It's looking at long-term health from these pregnancies. And so the longitudinal, you'll look at different sort of checkpoints throughout the life and see how these interventions might have affected the future. A case study is usually one person or a few people and how it, uh, how like, um, certain things might come from these like small group of people. And usually it's for rare cases, not necessarily um, uh, like a whole group that looks uh, at intervals like a longitudinal study does. But a case study is usually just like a special case. And you're looking at sort of what makes this special and what's affecting these small, very, very small group or oftentimes an individual. And so D is not looking like our best answer choice. So C is our best answer choice, longitudinal study, because you have checkpoints throughout this longitudinal learning. And so with that, we're six for six. We crushed it. Great work, team. All right, great work, team. We crushed that psych -Soch passage. Six questions with a lot of great information. So kudos for you for getting it done. Now, I really, really want to emphasize that you must get these terms in your head, right? Understand the concepts, understand the terms, because this is the pool that the MCAT brings from every single test. And so if you understand them, it'll make your psych -Soch studying a lot easier on test day. Now, if you like this video, give us a like down below and subscribe to our channel and comment exactly what types of videos and content you're looking forward to next. Additionally, check out our MCAT 528 strategy series from Vic Vikram. Super, super helpful strategies that'll help you maximize your studying before test day. And finally, click the link in our bio to sign up for the MCAT question of the day so you don't miss out on any practice before your test day. Happy studying and let's get it.